Today is June the 18th, 2023. Don Crossum gives a message entitled, The Kingdom of the World Has Become the Kingdom of Our Lord and of His Christ. Lord, we commit this time to you. You're such a God of glory. And Lord, we want you to any time intervene, move in, uh, to know your will, Lord. And as we move into this new dimension of the kingdom, Lord, direct us. May we hear your voice. You have said the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Josh, I don't know if there's a ring. Can you hear me okay, or is it kind of a ring? Yes, sir. Kind of a ring? Okay. I'll let Josh kind of correct that. Um, there's been a little bit of a dilemma because June the 1st, I heard a voice, and, and when I say a voice in my spirit, but it was clear, real clear, and, and I was reluctant even about sharing it YouTube, because you never know who's hearing, how they would interpret it. But I'd been, the Lord had been directing me to a section of scripture. And as you know, every uh, month I teach uh, the book of Revelation, the last Saturday of each month for about three hours. And thank you, those of you who've been attending. But in that, uh, the last, I, I, I will engage the scriptures every night, usually. Uh, sometimes study two, three hours, four hours in the day. I, I get into other scriptures, and because if you study Revelation, that'll happen. I felt part of the scroll the Lord has given me uh, for these years has been to help to steward, that is, in my life and others around me, uh, the cloud of witness, uh, the angelic realm, and knowing and receiving our scroll and walking in it. And the most recent has been the scroll. And so, uh, as I had memorized, as you know, years ago, the book of Revelation, and now I will read parts of it, engage parts of it, uh, meditate upon it, and uh, the Lord will often lead me to a scripture. Sometimes I'll kind of go over just to make sure I can remember it, but other times he'll give me a scripture, I will engage it, and I can't leave it. I will leave it, I have to come back. And there are some different ways that I know that I'm to engage a scripture. And uh, the Bible says in Revelation 1, he says, uh, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it because the time is near. It's one of the first of seven blessings in the book of Revelation. And that really is what changed my whole desire and focus on that book. And the Lord opened it, which he promised come some 50 years ago. He told me not, I couldn't preach from it. Teach, I could teach excerpts, as you know the story, but I was not to try to teach through it until he gave me that open door. So about 12, 13 years ago now, he said, now I want you to hide this word in your heart and I'm going to teach it to you. I'm going to open it up. And boy, is there a lot to open up. I mean, there are like levels and levels and levels. And things, you know, every day almost I see something new, something, uh, a new dimension. But the scripture that he gave to, uh, that, that it just stuck in my heart was from chapter 11. And he says, uh, the seventh angel sounded. And that was interesting. Because in chapter 10, he says the angel who foot put his foot on right hand on uh, his right foot on the sea, his left on the land, he lifted his hands toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heavens, the things in it, and earth, things in it, the sea, and the things in it, that time would be no longer, there would be no longer a delay. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, then the mystery of God is finished. That always fascinated me. In fact, probably the next uh, study, I'll do a little bit more on that. But nevertheless, I was, had been meditating on chapter 11, and it says, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, 
the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat on the throne before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who art and who were. Notice they didn't say the usual form of he who was and is and is to come. They don't say is to come. There's a reason for that. I'm not trying to exegete that now, but nevertheless, who art and were, because you have taken your great power, you have begun to reign. The nations were enraged, your wrath came, and the time to judge had to come had to judge the dead. And, uh, well, the nations were enraged, your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, those who fear your name, the small, the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And then he says, the temple of God, which is in heaven, was open, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, sounds, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake. Now, that's, that's only a little part of one chapter. But I became fascinated. I mean, it wasn't just fascination. The Lord will, will hide something in my heart. He'll, he'll stir it. And, and I may kind of try to leave it. Well, that was nice. And I can't. I just keep coming back. It's, it's like that's what, there are ways that I know the Lord's given me a word of the prophecy. A word of the prophecy. It says, blessed is who reads. Then he says, blessed are those who hear the word of the prophecy. And, you know, I, I've already, we studied 15 or more hours just on those first few verses. So I can't go over all that again. But, but there are words of prophecy for every person who's a believer in this book. Now, their, their warnings were not to add to the words of the prophecy and were not to take away from the words of the book of this part. There's a difference, in, but that'd be too much uh, groundwork tonight. So nevertheless, this, this prophecy, I knew it was become, it was a word of the prophecy. It was growing. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get away from it. And so on June the 1st, uh, when I woke up, the Lord says, and something was stirring really deep in my heart. And the Lord says, this is the seventh trumpet that's sounding for you. That's going to sound weird to some until I try to explain a little bit. And I thought, how could I be, I, you know, I didn't hear anything out there, but how could this be the seventh trumpet? Now, sometimes you can give, like you shared about the bird that flew by, and oh, it's just coincidental. And so I'm not trying to make something happen and tie something together that doesn't tie. But it was interesting, seven years ago during the first is when we moved in the house that we now live in, where well, it doesn't mean anything. It, well, it sort of does, but I'm not going to push it. But I want to share with you this, that... It's important when we come to the book of Revelation, the reason it doesn't mean that much to some people and we don't receive those prophetic words on an individual basis because we don't understand who it was written to. So it's not to do, go into a lengthy teaching, but I'm just going to remind you this. The book of Revelation is written to three groups. Many people don't know that. Let me tell you who they are. They're written to churches. They're written to individuals, and they're written to the nations. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him who is, was, and is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne to the church. And then he says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, uh, he who loves you, released you from sins by his own blood, and has made you kings and priests, that's the order of Melchizedek, and... Uh, uh, and, and he has made you to be kings and priests, his God and Father, glory, and to you be glory and dominion forever and ever to him. So it's written to individuals. In the seven churches, chapter 2 and 3, every church that he addresses to the angel of that church, then he says, he who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The book of Revelation is written to churches, be a church. The book of Revelation is written to individuals. And then it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see, even those who pierced him. Everyone pierced him. It was our sin that put him on the cross. And uh, and all the tribes of the earth, and that also means nations, will mourn over him. 
Even so, amen. And then he concludes by saying, I am, uh, I am the Lord God who is, was, and is to come, the Almighty. So I hope you'll get that. He's, he, this is written, the book of Revelation, to churches. That's where he's at the end of Revelation. I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify to you for the churches. So this is for churches. But it's not only for churches. It's for you and I individual. See, that's what a lot of people miss. They don't understand that there are words of prophecy for us individual that can help to direct our lives in any circumstance situation you don't just go through and try to grab it let it grab you the holy spirit will give you that word of the prophecy it's not it's not a word of the book it's the word of this prophecy and he to obey the things which are written in the book and so just so you'll know that up front and when he says then the seventh angel sounded if a person, you start trying to study this from the standpoint of nations, you know what? It's not going to mean a lot to you. I could tell you why. It'll mean something. But that's not where you start. You, you, he does have prophecy for churches. I could give you a lot of background, but I'm not going to go there tonight. Uh, but it's powerful words. Personally, the Lord had me to start personal application. That's where I started. And I knew, I mean, I've been, st I have early church fathers. I have books from, uh, I have one book that's 100 year old. It was written in 1730s. Uh, all kind of books. Some of the leading, I think, theologians in probably in the earth. And yet, you know, there's so many different views, so many variations. But let me tell you where they are. They're because different people make different applications. A lot of people today start with, this is what's happening nationally. Well, that is a prophecy, but that is the first place you start. Blessed is he. And anyhow, so I started studying this, knowing it can speak to nations, knowing it definitely speaks to churches, but I began to read it personally. I said, Lord, what are you saying to me? What is the word of the prophecy? That's how I began. So let me say this, and I'm going to kind of hurry on this, uh, or try. When it said, the seventh the trumpet, every one of you has seven trumpets possibly going through. That would shake some people. Every one of you has seven seals within you that needs to be opened. That's for your personal life and history. Every church has seven trumpets to go through seven seals and guess what the nations and final history and yes there's a there is a uh, consummation of all things out there yet to come in which nationally openly there'll be seven churches seven seals seven trumpets seven bowls but they're varied they're for churches they're for individuals and they're for the nations those are the three sections to start out with in Revelation chapter 1. That's where I spent most of my time to start with. So let me go now to chapter 15 so you'll kind of understand that. And uh, I'm going to try real fast here. So forgive me if I go too fast. So I'm going to go to Revelation 15. And remember, this can be for a church. But you know what? This can be for you. You may not be in the seventh trumpet. You might be in the third it doesn't mean that trumpet is judgment on you. God's bringing forth blessings, but he also brings forth judgments, and he said it's time to judge the dead. And usually if there is an understanding of a scripture, we're not sure what it means. Usually the understanding is given in that chapter, in that section. And when he says it's time to judge the dead, he tells us who the dead are to destroy those who destroy the earth. And I can show you the exact scripture where that comes from. So let's start in uh, uh, kind of looking at the application as a prophetic word, I think, for us. It's a word of prophecy. It's not a word of prophecy necessarily for the nations. It could be, yet it might be. It's not necessarily for all the churches at large. I think it's for us individually, but for our church. 
and a lot of times it may be given to one or two, especially in leadership, and uh, it may not be given to everyone personally, but the flow of that, the anointing of that, the anointing is like starts at the top of your head, it flows down, it covers the body, even the feet, and that anointing flows to everyone. Okay? And so whatever blessing may come to those, you know what, most of you are pillars in the church. And so anything that starts on you is going to flow down to the whole body, I believe. So in Revelation chapter 1, or I'm sorry, chapter 11, I'm going to try to go through this pretty fast. Uh, I've already given probably, well, the guys already tell me, Don, you lay your groundworks so much that you're through before you get started. Uh, so here it is. Then the seventh trumpet sounded. Hours could be spent on the trumpets. Many trumpets are mentioned in the Old Testament. Are you aware of that? There were trumpets for war. There were trumpets for the new month, new moon. There were trumpets when it was time for the whole camp of Israel to move. There were trumpets uh, when they were going to war. Many trumpets. So, But each trumpet had a sound. A sound. Sound is important, and they knew the sounds. And a lot of time, the trumpet might blow once, or it may blow until that victory is experienced, such as Jericho. They just blow it once. They kept blowing it for seven days. So he says, in the beginning of the voice of the seventh trumpet, when it should begin to sound. <clears throat> well, what the Lord was showing me, I believe, is when I read the scripture, began to meditate upon it, engage, and see, don't just go and try to make it happen. That's one reason I'm reluctant when I give personal testimonies, because you may think, hey, you've got experience that way. No, you, it may not even come close to the way I experience it. You have to experience it God's way and what he has for you. And I woke up that morning and he said, and I had this, I, I just, I knew, I couldn't get away from the scripture. He says, you're hearing the seventh trumpet. Now remember, a church can hear a trumpet. The whole nation can hear a trumpet. Where do you hear it? I mean, we don't have people blowing trumpets. Well, turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4. I believe that's it. Jeremiah, chapter 4. And I want to read to you uh, verse, yeah, let me find it here. Jeremiah, chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 19. My soul, my soul. I am in anguish. Oh, my heart, my heart is pounding in me. I cannot be silent because you have heard, oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. You know where the trumpet we hear? I can give you other scriptures, Isaiah 58, 1. But I think to go on, that the trumpet we can hear in our soul, in our heart, in our bowels, you can't get away from it. You know when it's God is saying something. You know what I mean? It's a trumpet. Now remember, it's not just trumpets. There are churches. There are seven seals. There are seven trumpets. There are seven bowls. So I'm not trying to figure all that out. That's the reason we're going slowly, month by month. Don't try to get ahead of yourself. But I knew it was a trumpet. I knew God was saying something to me, especially personally, and I felt like he was saying something to the church. And here's what he said. The seventh angel sounded. There are angels, great angelic ministry. We need to be aware of that, very aware of it. There's an angel for this church. There's an angel for every church. There's a host of angels. You have angels uh, that have been assigned to you. No, we, we know you don't worship them. But we know that when we are aware of them, we're drawn to the Lord and read Psalms 103. And so I said, well, Lord, what is that trumpet sound? What is it about? So I go back to Revelation chapter 11, and he began to me, and I knew it was for me, but I also knew that it was for the church. And you'll, you might say, well, Don, I didn't hear it. That's okay if you didn't hear it, because wherever there's leadership, it can flow, the blessings of that can flow, flow down to you. All of what I'm saying, I've already kind of said that. Okay, listen to what he says. The trumpet sounded, the seventh trumpet, and it said, there were loud voices in heaven. Now, 
I could tell you the number of vo times it says loud voice. Sometimes it's a musical. Sometimes it's a multitude. But in this case, it's the voice. It's the tone that is listened to. Now, here's what they were saying. The kingdom of the world. Some will say the kingdoms, but because Satan is the prince of power there and, and uh it, it could be either the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. That's pretty powerful. The kingdom of the world has become. Now, a moment I'm going to answer, if the kingdom of the world has come in Revelation chapter 11, why are we in such a mess? Why is there so much dilemma, so much chaos, so much confusion? Well, there's a reason for that. But first, I want to tell you what the kingdom is. The kingdom, Jack Taylor, who's now with the Lord, but one day he told me, he said, Don, the kingdom is God's way of doing business. And I would call it, you know, that, that's a pretty good definition. But I've realized there's a kingdom of this world and there's a kingdom of God. A quick definition of the kingdom of this world is found in 1 John chapter 2. And all, it says, do not love the world nor the things in it. All that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, which is everything that acts separate from the Spirit of God, and the boastful pride of life. That's the world system. Someone has put it like this. It's, I had it written here, it's what you do, it's what you have, and who you know. It's a pretty good little formula. But if anyone has the love of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And there's a world system. Do you believe it? Then why did Satan offer to give to Jesus the kingdoms of this world if he didn't own them? Now, I could tell you something else, but I'd be going down another trail except to tell you that it wasn't just because of Adam's sin and transgression that man sinned, but because there were many that transgressed. You know who they were? They were fallen angels. I didn't mean to go there, but I can tell you there were fallen angels who also helped to transgress and pollute the earth. And they were divided. Kingdoms were divided when they fell. You can read it in some ancient scriptures. There's a book called The Unseen Realm. I'd encourage you to read it. The guy I went to be with the Lord about two months ago. He's a great theologian and scholar. But nevertheless, much has been designed to destroy this age, to destroy our world. So there's a kingdom of the world. And it's vicious. And it's been controlled by Satan. And when you become a Christian, we're delivered out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. But there's something interesting about the kingdom. Do you really know what it is? I'm just going to give you a quick rundown, okay? First of all, the kingdom of God is called the kingdom of God. But there, to be a king, to have a kingdom, you would have to have a throne and a ruler. Well, Psalms chapter 89 tells us what that throne is, and it says that it has the foundation of the throne, which is a seat of authority, is righteousness and justice, and mercy and truth go before it. And Jesus is King of King and Lord of Lords, and it looks to me like the Father and the Son are both on the throne. I can't describe all of the throne, but it has a king, it has a ruler, and that ruler is the Father and His Son Jesus, the Anointed One. Not only is there a ruler, but it has dimensions. It's interesting, the Bible speaks of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. I'm not going into that. Some people have studied for years and years and say they're synonymous, and others says no, they're different. The main difference I have found is that parables and teachings about the kingdom of heaven seems to include lost and saved and the division. That's the, key, the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Notice the good seed, the bad seed, the good soil, the bad soil. Uh, you'll, you'll find every parable, the good fish, the bad. In every, par every one of those seven parables, you'll find the mysteries of the kingdom. The kingdom of God seems to be more the pure. It's only the believer, the righteous. I kind of think of it like this, and I can be correct, and I'll change. But I see the kingdom of heaven is 
this huge circle, everything in the cosmos, uh, the cosmos is the kingdom of heaven because God's over the heaven of heavens. But And so we're all in the kingdom of heaven. And there's some mysteries. But inside of that, there's a kingdom of God that he alone rules, and we're born into that kingdom, and that's only a believer's. You can correct that? I'll change, but that's my understanding at this point. So there are dimensions. There's that... Uh, it's my Jesus says my kingdom is not of this world it is of heaven there is a dimension of space of time of ages of uh, uh, there, there's a local expression of the kingdom and there are keys of the kingdom I'm just now understanding I'm just now getting into keys of the kingdom I think I think we have no idea are the keys of the king, what they are. Through many tribulations, we enter the kingdom. Why tribulation? Because when we go through pressure, we're learning, we learn, the, I, I don't particularly like the word techniques, but I'm going to use it. We learn the techniques, the pattern, the ways of God in opening that door, the answer. Someone else says, we also learn how to open it from the inside to bring it back here. So there are dimensions of the kingdom, and uh, there are different functions of the kingdom. In my Father's house are many rooms, and so through many tribulations, we enter the kingdom. There's laws and standards, and, and uh, there's a right and wrong. There's, there's uh, uh, limitations, but basically, you see, I could go hours and hours, couldn't I, on this, but basically... The law is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What is life? I could give a lot of examples on that. And then there are subjects. You need subjects in the kingdom. Well, that's where we come in. That's going to be kind of the next point I have, that, that there are subjects, and that those subjects are not only believers and those who have come into the kingdom. Wow, it has a pretty large population. There are angels seraphim and cherubim and ophanim and, and powers and principalities and rulers and there's a whole hierarchy innumerable angels and then his people can you imagine the host they're subjects all of them have different subjects and 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 standards and roles and then of course their benefits all the benefits Protection, gifts, assistance, rewards. This is a book. It could be. So, the kingdom. That's interesting. Because when you read, sometimes you may read a, the, quote, theological book, or maybe even one that's not so theological. And they'll mention the kingdom, and they'll talk about the kingdom is now and is yet to come. You ever read that? It's now, and it's yet to come. John Wimber, you see, that is kind of, you know, blow my mind. I said, what do you mean it's now, and it's yet to come? But I understand that now. So let me tell you, it's a dimension. It's a realm. It's in the spirit. It does, there's space, time, but it's, it's almost, couldn't measure it. When do we pray? The first prayer, or one prayer we all know. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then what? Thy kingdom come. Do you know what that is in the Greek? It's an imperative. And actually, it's not, oh, God, please bring your king. It's not that. In the imperative, it's actually kingdom come. You can command it. Kingdom come. Well, wait a minute. You mean... We're to pray today for the kingdom to come? Yes. In fact, I would just, you know, here's how I get to all this studying, and I get more than I have time to share. But I was thinking about the kingdom day, and I just started writing this down. And the first thing I know about a person getting into the kingdom is in John 3, it says, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom. Well, that word see doesn't mean, well, you just kind of hear it. No, it means to understand, to perceive, to experience when you are born from above, your eyes are open. You're given spiritual eyes. 
You know what else? When you're born from above and you're of your father, you receive the father's nature in you. If you're of the devil, you're not born again. It says you are of your father, the devil. You have one of those natures. You don't have two of them. You don't have two natures. The old nature has been liberated. It's not there. You may have result to the old nature, and it's called flesh. But it's no longer I that sin, Paul says, but it's the law of sin that works in my members. You have a new nature. That's who God in you, Christ in you. So first, except for a man be born from above, he cannot see. Now, you know what the next part of that very same section Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Wow. First, see, perceive, experience. Now he says, you also, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter. You mean you can enter? Yes, because when you receive Christ and you have that new nature, Christ is in you and he is the kingdom. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. But guess what? The kingdom is in you. Now, that word kingdom, there's a word that says he's near you, he's in your midst, and it can also be in you. To the Pharisees, he said, he's in your midst. But see, those words, depending upon the context, is how translators translate it. But the truth is, he's in us. As a believer, Christ in us, the hope of glory. But did you there how many people have the kingdom, but they don't have a clue what some of the keys are. And so, except you be born of water and the spirit, I think water is not on the washing of water by the word, but it's the troubles and testings and tribulations, those deep waters, and the spirit of God. My brethren, count all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, the trying of your faith works patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be mature and lacking nothing. And so God begins to mature you. He begins, and you will press into him. And what really is happening, you're entering the kingdom, and God is showing you the dimensions of the kingdom. And they're so marvelous and beyond. I tell you, we've probably been entering the kingdom a long time. See, there's a place where you enter, have access into. Did you know there's another word that you inherit the kingdom? There's a whole list of behaviors that people said, those have this behavior. They will not inherit the kingdom. It doesn't mean they never entered. They may have initially got in the door, but God wants us to inherit the whole thing. And we inherit the kingdom. So you see, you enter. Then something else happens. He told... Uh, one of the disciples in, I think it's Luke chapter 12. Uh, well, no, let me back up. It's, uh, I've got it. But anyhow, he says that wherever demons have to flee, where the Spirit of God comes up, the, where demons flee, the Spirit of God comes upon you, the kingdom of God is come upon you. The kingdom of God. So we find that we, ent- we see, we enter, the kingdom of God comes upon us. When did that happen? At Pentecost, you shall be endued with power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You following me? There are dimensions of the kingdom. We shouldn't be surprised. If we had the full kingdom in our midst, we probably wouldn't be here. If we really walked in kingdom power, you know what would happen? We could like be like Peter and John or like Peter. We'd be going to church and people just driving by our car on the freeway would be healed. You'll think, I'm kidding. No, I'm not. That's what it says about Peter when he walked down to the temple and people were just in his shadow, in his presence, and they would get healed. That's the same thing. That didn't mean everybody was there in that dimension. But some were because they were experiencing a fullness of the kingdom. The presence of God himself, his power, his awesomeness. Now, this is what's interesting. In Revelation 11, he says, now remember, this is chapter 11. This isn't chapter 1. Chapter 11, he says, the kingdom, here was the seventh trumpet. You realize what all they've been through? 
God, in these trumpets, he's not only purging and dealing with the world. You can read this. I'm not going to take all the scriptures. I mean, when this happened, God only deals with those who have tried to harm you and have do harm you. And the church, he's going to deal severely with them. And in the days of the seventh trumpet, I'm going to tell you, God is going to stop some of the wickedness and the persecution. But it may not happen overnight because there are some events to yet take place. Don't suddenly think. And here's what happened. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. You'll say, well, who is that Lord? Is that Christ? Well, actually, the Lord is probably God the Father because it says uh, in the next verse, uh, 24 elders fell down and worship the Lord God. Thou say, worth, uh, we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty. You know, this is Father's Day. What we're really doing is we're honoring the Heavenly Father because everything about the kingdom is the Father, and though he does deliver it over to Jesus, and they both, it says in chapter 11, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, the anointed, the Messiah. And they shall reign forever and ever. Now, you want to know something about this verse? I'm not a Greek scholar. I've had two years of Greek, and I'm sorry to say I've lost, forgot a lot of it. That was years ago. But the word has become is an aorist intent. This begin, begins a stream of verbs that are in the aorist tense. And an aorist tense is looking to the future as, as something that's already complete now. That's the meaning of it. It's complete. It's already been complete. But it's looking to the future for what is now complete. And, and one, one translation says the kingdoms of this world are becoming well, they are, but they're still yet. They're now. What it means, it is so certain that the kingdom of this world that has come, has come in chapter 11, is the way of seeing what will be completed in the future, but it's completed now. It will happen. And there are 11 of them, or 9 or 10 that follow. M many of the verses after this. It's more than is, but it's yet to come. In a way, that's true. But he says, you have it now. The kingdom of this world has become. How does it have become? What it means, I think, is this. When it starts, there's a new dimension. It's like where Saul, you entered, you came upon, you had baptized in the Holy Spirit, some might disagree, but I don't know how else to see this. There is a dimension in our lives that God brings us to that the kingdom of God so embraces us and surrounds us. It has come. And we see the end from the beginning. It is going to happen, but here's what takes place. There's such a new dimension of that kingdom that wherever you go, you're going to see people's attitude changes. You're going to see different things line up. You're going to see the influence of the kingdom. It's going to be different. Doors may open that you never thought would open. Now, I know that's, that's a challenge, and I'll tell you why. We are walking and will walk and can walk. You'll say, well, I haven't had the seventh trumpet sound in your heart. But if you're in a group where that's happened, it will flow down on you. And you'll probably have some. But let me tell you, why wait till chapter 11 for the kingdom of the world to become? The kingdom of the world becomes a kingdom. It changes. We don't just change it. It changes. Why wait till chapter 11? Because after chapter 11, something powerful begins to happen. You know what? I am not a prophet. Some 
Say, Don, you're a prophetic seer. All I know is I don't want to claim to be that. If God says that, if people who would say how. But it's you have to be careful in our day because there's a lot that's going out. So don't walk too much in caution. But I believe this. Our world is in a mess. We have to agree. I'm not saying there's not good, but there's a lot of crises going on. And, and I don't even listen to some things anymore. But I can tell you after chapter 11, all you have to do is read the next chapter. Chapter 12, the dragon comes. There's a lot of good things, but everything that God does, the dragon is attacking it. It's the red dragon, then the dragon, then it's called the serpent. There, there's a diminishing of it. Chapter 13, the dragon stands on the sands of the seashore, and there's the beast comes up out of the sea, a beast that comes up out of the land. So we have the, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. You come to chapter 14, hallelujah, the, the 144,000, that great group of saints upon Mount Zion, which is, doesn't mean they're just in heaven, but they are in heavenly places. It's a new dimension. And Mount Zion, read about in chapter 12 of Hebrews, we have come to Mount Zion. You come to chapter 15, and it says, And I saw a great marvelous sign in heaven. Uh, seven angels had seven plagues, which are the last, because in the wrath of God is finished. You come to chapter uh, 16, it is finished. You come to chapter 17, and it talks about the beast and uh, Mystery Babylon. Uh, you come to chapter uh, 18, and it's the destruction of Babylon, Mystery Babylon. So guess what? Before a glorious fulfillment, when heaven, when the kingdom of this world becomes a kingdom of our God, we're going to have to walk in that new kingdom dimension because there is a dragon, there's a beast, there's a false prophet, and there's Mystery Babylon. And she has three characteristics. She can be in a city, she can be in an individual, she can be in a church. It's a spirit, it's a structure. And there's about four or five chapters that's related to that mystery. And it's something the church has to deal with. Finally, the Lord says, come out of her. And he says, her sins have piled up as high as heaven. And God has remembered her uh, iniquity. Do not participate. Do come out of her so you'll not participate in her sin and receive of her plagues. We'll talk about that someday on a Saturday morning. Nevertheless, but what I am saying, there is a dimension that when things are really looking pretty tough, other, uh, probably other ages have experienced this, other Christians, I believe that. I believe in different times of uh, history that I believe there were times when a church heard the seventh trumpet, a person heard the seventh trumpet, eventually in history there'll be a final seventh trumpet and it'll be over. I think we're beginning to hear a seventh trumpet for our time. And God wants us to be joined so closely to him. I do want, I'm going to give you this one scripture because yeah, you've been very gracious. And uh, that is in uh, Jeremiah because some of you may be wondering uh, when it says the time has come for the dead to be judged and to reward the bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great. Let me tell you, there's gonna be a reward of bondservants like we never imagined. You know what I think? I think the reward is all the things God begins reward from the kingdom. We have so little understanding of what the kingdom is. I just gave you some dimensions. I can't explain to you why in the last two years, Three years, a few years ago, I began to have visitation from angels. Don't, you don't have to do that. But for me, I was probably so needy. I began to experience a cloud of witnesses in the most unusual ways. That doesn't mean you've got to or you're not spiritual if you don't. But I think that as I've heard the seventh trumpet for me, but I think it can be for you. It can run down over you. It may not, but I think it can. And, and I kept wondering, why is all this happening? What, what is, 
uh, I was in my room the other night. I'm not going to give the details of what had happened. Usually, though, though that the Lord will usually remind you of someone. He'll give you an understanding. You'll read something. You'll get a letter. It's usually he kind of introduce you ahead of time. And I was sitting there, and I had a call of witness from a person I had not seen in years. And um, a person very, very dear to my heart. I just, I think I can share. He was a son. He died when he was 15 months. I'd seen him once or twice. He would have been 56 this past month. And lo and behold, I've received information. Someone had sent me a picture of his headstone. And boy, something, it wasn't just the emotions of that. And I'm sitting in my room, and he appears to me. You'll say, how? His presence, it can be presence. It can be like a, what I call a word, silhouette. That word, I've got to write it down and boom. It can be a silhouette. It can be in physical form, but it was so real, I had no question I knew who he was. And and we sat there, or we I talked, and Daniel helped me to talk about to walk in my room, and he caught me kind of crying. I was so embarrassed, and I tell me I'm having a cloud of witness, but it lasted for some while, and he began to answer things I, I marveled at. About two months ago. Another a person came to me. I'm not free to share. I've shared with one or two. I always share with the guys that are around me because I don't want to get into deception. I don't want to get into something that's wrong. And I don't mind being, I don't mind anything being judged always by the blood of Jesus. And I have a whole list, seven things that he said I've come to help you with. And if I told you, you, you would be somewhat surprised. I'm not saying that to be cure, cure, uh, strip your curiosity or or glamorous or something. I'm sharing with you when we start getting to the end of some of those things, those things are going to speed up. God knows what we need. You may not need some of them, but he is going to he's going to reward us. He's going to equip us with realms and dimensions because he knows not only our blessings, but what we've got to face. And then the end comes. And I can tell you what the end is. It's a heavenly city. Well, we can live in that heavenly city now. But I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. I saw the holy city coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will no longer be any death, nor crying, sorrow, or mourning. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said to me, Right, these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. It is done. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Then he goes on to say and describe the heavenly city, oh, on and on. I'm going to tell you, maybe the seventh trumpet hasn't sounded. Maybe you're not even sure what it is. I wouldn't have known. I'm not even sure what the fourth and fifth was. But I know what I heard, and I knew I heard in my heart. And I don't know where you are, but I know for the church, God wants us to come into a new dimension. And we just have to receive. It's him. It's his kingdom. It's not us. We don't earn it. But there are rewards. 